Hello, hello everybody. Okay, I'm back in the Bay uh, after traveling to Berlin. I went there to deliver three presentations. Uh, one for SciDAO, uh, which is a yeah using distributed systems to fund promising psychedelic research. I presented about um, you know our think tank model and psychophysics toolkits uh, for how QRI can essentially advance this field in a high yield and rigorous fashion. <laughs> I also talked at a AI Hope event, uh, which was organized by Foresight and Seed Club Ventures. A really interesting event because, you know, they're trying to do a balancing act, uh, really cutting the Gordian knot of <laughs> the unfortunate unfolding culture war that is happening between doomers and accelerationists, where obviously we need a much more nuanced approach that um, yeah, uh, gives us hope and allows us to, to coordinate ever in these uh, difficult, difficult times um, with a lot of failure of cooperation. And then, yeah, finally, uh, I did a presentation uh, along with Beta uh, at the <laughs> uh, QRI meetup, the first Berlin QRI meetup. Uh, 100 people attended, a lot of latent connections. Anyway, uh, I'm back, very energized and very happy to talk to you about a, a really interesting topic today. Um, which is, uh, yeah, the, the way in which, you know, the topological solution to the boundary problem sheds light on subagentic structures um, that we have. And also, you know, what does it feel like <laughs> to be one of these pockets and how do you get there? Okay, so a little bit of a reminder, you know, QRI's model for what the brain is doing, what kind of computer it is. It is not a classical computer in the standard sense. It's not just a Turing machine or even just a massively distributed, you know, parallel system of discrete neurons interacting with each other. No, because there's also a function of the field that is top down. You know, local field potentials are influencing the probability for neurons to fire, just as, you know, the neurons firing influences the shape of the field. So there's a, a, a dual relationship here. Uh, QRI's model is that the brain is a nonlinear optical computer, <laughs> essentially something like laser chess. Uh, have you played laser chess? Uh, Google it. It's, it's really, really fun. It's kind of like you have like one laser coming from you, one laser coming from the opponent. And the pieces are things like mirrors or absorbers or beam splitters that what they do is like they modify the way this laser is, you know, <laughs> moving around in the pieces. So it gets very intricate actually, because with a bunch of splitters and mirrors, you know, the, the laser is going all over the place and then you move the wrong piece and bam, you know, your, your, your king is hit and then you die <laughs> or vice versa. You know, it's very chaotic. It's very hard to actually uh, play this at a, at a high level because tracking all the counterfactuals for how the, the, the light will move in the board. Well, it's something like that, you know, in meditation, sometimes you go through um, interesting transitions you were not expecting. And one way of formulating this is that you made a subtle change, like a subtle move in the chessboard, in the laser chessboard. And then the laser just completely changed, you know, how, how, how it's, uh, what the standing wave pattern is, essentially. Um, so we have two things, you know, we have topological pockets that define the boundaries, and then you have kind of a beam of pure awareness, you know, not yet with any content that is being reflected, diffracted and diffused through probably a kind of pneumatic substance <laughs> that is being regulated by the brain tissue. Okay, very different perspective than how neuroscientists think about this uh, and also maybe mystics, although there's of course huge overlap, you know, mystics might be saying something like, you're a being of light, you know, tra trapped in some kind of you know, matter-based media or something like that. And I would say, well, yes, I mean, pure consciousness might be, yeah, these like waves in the field and you're a standing wave pattern trapped in a pocket playing a role, <laughs> which is for the survival of your organism, the spread of your genes, and hopefully also for the well-being of consciousness, yours and everybody's. <laughs> okay, so getting on to the, to, the, to the juicy part of this topic. Okay, so metaphorically, you know, I really love soap bubbles because the topology that they produce is actually not entirely trivial. Of course, okay, just just one soap bubble, right? Like it's, these would be maybe, you know, the state of pure consciousness in a way, what it feels like to quote unquote have pure consciousness where the light is the surface 
uh, is traveling along the surface. You know, there's some kind of medium that is guiding the light. You know, there's a wave guide, uh, as it were. And, uh, and there's not much structure. So this might be kind of a, you know, peak 5-MeO DMT experience or cessation or something like that, where the field is completely, um, completely smooth, lacking any internal boundaries or partitions. And so you are just this very clean standing wave pattern inside it. Um, okay, but like usually though, <laughs> let's see if I can do this. Um, essentially, yeah, I was practicing the other day like you can actually kind of uh, hit this. Okay, there you go. Now this, okay, depending on how you look at this, you know, this is just the one pocket or two. In a given paradigm that I'm going to explain, this is just one pocket. Why? Because it is um, all connected through more than zero dimensional uh, intersection points. Whereas, you know, if you had like another soap bubble here that was only connected to this through one point, just one point alone, you know, not a line, not a surface, you know, just one point, that would constitute a boundary and a global boundary because through, you know, a point, there's no information you can share, you know, zero dimensional. Um, however, here, you know, this part of the field does, ooh, <laughs> let's see if I'll, let me re re reproduce it. So, yeah, kind of like, you can also yeah, start making like more complex objects, actually. Let, let's uh, start doing that. Okay, so, um, <laughs> I really should, okay. Here we have a somewhat more complex structure. Um, you know, you can emit waves from one region of the surface to the whole surface, right? Okay, so two things to point out. <laughs> one, this is all in, in, in a sense topologically connected, but two, there's a fascinating kind of hierarchical structure for different dimensions of topologies here. So you have you know, surfaces, you have lines, and then you have points, okay? Um, here's the thing. Um, each of those, you know, actually will generate a different type of cavity for resonance, okay? So, you know, what it might feel like to actually be a structure like this? Well, you need to take into account the resonant modes of each of these, you know, phases, each of these uh, surfaces, but then also, interestingly, ooh, yeah, let's see. Oh, there you go. <laughs> You've got to take into account the resonant modes also of, you know, the phases where these uh, uh, bubbles interface and the lines, because the lines will also have the resonant modes. Okay, so uh, here is kind of like an interesting implication here. Um, I would argue that, you know, very complex states of consciousness. Okay, yeah, this is like a, an intricate experience. Okay. Um, each of those topological features, you know, actually whether it's the, you know, the volume or the faces or the lines will carry their own vibrations and are part of what this system can compute. So um, I would argue that, yeah, something like the subagentic structure of a moment of experience is contained in these internal topological partitions. And different substances, different interventions, meditation practices, and you know, just normal, regular stimuli might energize different, you know, differently dimensional regions <laughs> here. With, for example, something like salvia, you know, people describe you become kind of a fruit roll-up or a two-dimensional carpet <laughs> or something like that. And there's lots of entities, but the entities are kind of like on the surface of this carpet, as opposed to, you know, these like three-dimensional objects. Okay, so I think what's, what's going on in there is that uh, by energizing, you know, specifically just, let's say, the lines where these uh, <laughs> soap bubbles meet, you can actually encode information and agents, you know, with, with goals, desires, and valence gradients. Now, they're not separate from you. You know, they're still part of you. The thing is that, you know, you can have dualistic representations where like, well, because of the shape of the field, it feels like you're here looking over there. But you know, the key insight that I wanted to communicate here <laughs> is that um, the subagents can live on different regions of this topological hierarchy. And so, yeah, no, quite literally, there's these very weird effects where like sometimes the subagents actually live on a surface or they might even live on a line. Uh, well, I do think we're actually higher dimensional <laughs> by nature. We're not only just 3D. And so, yeah, subagents can also be 3D, but, you know, we're like one step higher um, at the very least. 
Okay, the last thing I want to mention, and this is just a teaser because this is a very, very complex topic, is what does it actually feel like to be one of these pockets? What I suspect right now is that it is um, essentially the superposition of all points of view within that pocket. Um, is the only way <laughs> I am able to explain some of the most exotic kind of like properties of consciousness, such as on Heidos LSD, for example, you can converge into just being one point uh, that is like one extreme state where it's kind of like all of the certainty is being located on the spatial, you know, domain as opposed to frequency domain. <laughs> um, that is almost zero information, right? Uh, that is very actually close, I would argue, to just one soap bubble with no intricate uh, structure in it, or maybe one soap bubble with a tiny singularity or something like that. Um, that is very, very, very close, though, to these very strange fractal intricate structures. Um, sort of like you take one of those fractal intricate structures and you see it from the right side, and boom, it just collapses into one point or into nothingness. Why are these so s close together in the state space? You know, a metaphor is something like your brain, again, is a kind of like a uh, fun mirror house. So if you're playing with mirrors, you know, if they're slightly, not entirely parallel, but almost parallel, you might see kind of like some crazy fractal structure, especially if there's like multiple mirrors and, you know, beam splitters. <laughs> and then the moment you align it, boom, it just collapses into like just a perfect tunnel or something like that, something that looks like just one point. Okay, so... A reason about it in those terms. You're kind of like light trapped in one of these funhouse mirrors. So very close to super complex fractal structures, sometimes you actually find, boom, where places where you're just collapsing to one point. Um, this is just one of many phenomena, but the other one is Indra's net, where like, yeah, you enter states of consciousness where it's very obvious that everything reflects everything else. And the entire information content of the experience is contained into any of his subsections. Yeah, that to me also feels very much like a standing wave pattern in a, in a funhouse mirror where you're the superposition of all points of view within it. Okay, just an intuition pump. Do with it uh, what, you <laughs> what you will. And good to see you, everybody. Talk to you another day on another topic. Infinite Bliss.